Boom, boom, boom. Speaking of Courage Podcast. What's up, Chase? Finally back. What's going on, Donnie? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're sitting in a tornado. Yeah. It sounds like we're on a creaking ship. <laughs> if you guys hear that, it's just really heavy winds today. And uh, the winds out in California are crazy right yeah. now. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things people that don't live in California don't realize. But uh, it really sounds like we're on a ship. Yeah. They, they probably won't hear it much. Yeah, hopefully not. Some of them, if it gets as bad as it was, they'll definitely hear a little bit. Just, just so you guys know, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. So. Yeah. So what's been up, man? Nothing much, man. Same old thing. Just finally back here to do another one of these. So. Yep. Who do we got today? So today we're doing Air Force. This yep. is going to be the Korean War Air Force, and his name was Louis Sibyl. And I believe that's the right pronunci- pronunciation of the last name. Couldn't find it anywhere, though. I, I can find it in text, but there's not a lot of videos on him. Yeah. Not a lot of info. So, again, hopefully we'll get that. S E B I L L L E. Yeah. So, Sibille. that's what I would I say. I don't know the ethnicity, so I can't Watch break it, it be down. Sibili or yeah, something like that. S- yeah. Some, some fancy something. Yeah. Regardless, he went by Lou, so we're going to go ahead and call him Lou so we can't mess Lou that up. Lou it is. But yeah. Korean War, actually a World War II veteran who served in Korea as well. So, okay. it's going to be another one of those two war vets. So, Lou, or Louis Sibyl, as we're going to call him, was born in 1915 in Harbor Beach, Michigan. And then he uh, was the son of a doctor and then his mother. So he actually had one of those, one of the better upbringings of, of a lot of the people that we cover. Okay, right? no drama. I don't know that there was no drama, not a whole ton of info, but having a doctor as a father, a physician, yeah. again, being born in 1915, he's going to experience the Great Depression, which starts in 1929, but he has an actively working father who's got a high money job. So it's going to be a little bit I wonder what effect that had, to doing. be one of the few that were okay during that time. Right, yeah. It's, it's interesting how families dealt with it and yeah. how communities dealt with it. and uh, Maybe something to prove, you know what I mean? Perhaps. He actually seems like he lived kind of a, a good life, though, because in 1934, he went to Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and became a member of the Gamma Phi Delta fraternity and a member of the drama club. So, so he's a frat boy. He's got money. He's, he's, <laughs> he's t- by definition of a frat boy. And then in the late 1930s, he moved to Chicago. So while he was in Chicago, he became a master of ceremonies in nightclubs. So, <laughs> yeah, you can kind of see what kind of guy he would be, right? 1930s, you can picture the, the big bands, you know, yeah. the big dancing. He's a master of ceremonies. So he's like the DJ now, you know, oh, he's, he's running Good looking everything. dude. Good looking guy. <laughs> he's been to the fraternity. He's probably still got money. Those, those nice tailored suits. And uh, he went by the name of uh, Lou Reynolds was, was his, his stage name or his working name as he was the master Louis of ceremonies. Louis Reynolds! Right. And he was described as a handsome, glib master of ceremonies who used to wow the customers with his own parody of My Blue Heaven. So he's singing and he's, he's putting glib on no show. Glib is insulting, isn't it? Well, Tom Cruise made glib kind of famous. Glib means me, me, uh, oh, like not taken serious. Oh, because so glib. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a uh, positive attribute, but it's, it, I think the way they're using it there is more as he's probably quick, quick with a joke and sarcastic oh, okay. and everything. But. Okay. Dad's a doctor, fraternity guy, living in Chicago in the 1930s. It seems like that's it's... Per- that's pretty cool. Probably a pretty cool life. He's probably one of those guys that, like, by today's standards, driving the nice car, you know, living yeah. that upscale L.A. life. But this is in Chicago. You know, when you live in the Midwest, Chicago's where it's at. Yeah. So think, think of that. Like, I can just picture the nice suits and the singing. Probably a lot of women. Probably a pretty good time yeah. there, if you figure. But 1941, Pearl Harbor is going to come along December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor doesn't just affect the poor farm kids or, or you know, the, the patriots. Pearl Harbor is going to affect everybody. So that's going to change his life just like it yeah. did everybody else's. So he's about 26 years old at this time when he's hearing the news on the radio and he's hearing it like everybody else. Despite what he has going for him, he's going to leave that good life behind and he's going to join the U.S. Army Air Corps as an aviation cadet. He wants to be a pilot. He wants to get in the fight just like all these other guys, right? Interesting at that time that even the higher class people, the more popular it was socialites and stuff. Exactly. It was it, cool. It huh? was across the board, and your status kind of determined perhaps what job you did. Like a richer guy is probably not going to want to go jump in the infantry. Yeah. You want to be the Air Corps because it's got the glamour and it's got everything else. But if you are a young man at home of military age, military age male who has no physical problems, people are going to be looking at you on the street wondering why you're not there. So, yeah. you know, you may not be able to talk your way out, talk your way out of it. So, but, but again, by, by all accounts, though, he was doing it for the right reasons. He just chose to be an aviation cadet. And he uh, actually enlisted 
on December 19th, 1941. So Pearl Harbor is December 7th. So right after. Despite the rush of patriotism, a lot of guys don't go until 43, 44. So he's one of those early enlistees. Or these, the he was fired up. Si- yeah, he's exactly. He's, fire- he's fired up. And he's not trying to find a cheap job. He's not trying to be, you know, I want to work in an office or, or even I want to work in the USO because I'm, I'm a master of ceremonies. I'm a singer. I know how to do these things, which he probably could have done. He probably could have used connections. He wants to be a pilot which is exciting, but it's dangerous Dangerous. as hell, especially at those times. And his age, he's 26 years old, which to us, 26 is a baby, right? But in the military, 26 is old. And there's actually an age cutoff of 26 to be um, a pilot. You can't be, it's 25. So he's two months over that. So he actually had to get a waiver to be able to even be a pilot. No way. Right? So that would have been a good excuse too. Oh, I wanted to be a a pilot, but I'm too old. So now I'm riding the desk. And nobody would have thought any less of him. But he wanted to be in the fight, and he wanted to be in the action. He's probably, you know, one of those, those guys that's always want to be at the forefront. He's the fraternity guy, yeah. so he wants to get in the fight, so he does. So Cadet Sabil underwent aviation training in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Perrinfield, Texas, and Lake Charles, Louisiana. And during that time, he was described as an outstanding pilot and leader, and his maturity was helpful to the younger flight trainees. We talk about it all the time. The military is almost a great melting pot of, of people from all over. So you're going to have farm kids, and you're going to have 18-year-olds with no life experience. So he's probably telling them stories. 26-year-old right, charismatic yeah, dude who's used to being on stage. He's used to being on stage. He's used to having women. You know, a lot of these guys, times were different back then, so they might have never experienced used those to kinds of things. Influential, exactly. Yeah. He, it, the fraternity life by itself. Yeah. College wasn't an option for most people back then. So yeah. he's gone through that already. So you can imagine... And he's, like you said, he's got great charisma and poise yeah. and charm, right? So it makes sense because he had been in the clubs, but that's, that kind of stuff carries over into the military. Just like anything, everybody brings their past life to the military. Yeah. Your past life might be you're an 18-year-old kid, or you might have been a construction worker, you might have had three kids, or, or what have you. But for him, he becomes a guy that other people are auto- automatically drawn to, and they're going to be looking up to him and yeah. his charm and everything like that. And he's going to end up completing training, and he's going to be commissioned a second lieutenant in the Air Corps Reserve on 10 July 1942. After that, he's going to be assi- assigned to McDill Field, Florida, for advanced training on the Martin B-26 Marauder, which is a medium bomber. We've talked about the different planes yeah. on here before, so this is going to be one of those medium size. And early in the war, these, these Marauders earned the nickname Widowmaker due to their high accident rate during takeoffs and landing. So not even in combat. There's just... They're very difficult to take off with and take Ugh. off to land. Military guys have a kind of a dark sense of humor. Yeah. But you don't want to, hey, here's your plane. This model's called a Widowmaker. That's generally not something you want, but that's, that's the kind of thing they these guys are into dealing it. with. And if it, those of you who aren't super into military history, you, you might be shocked at how many training deaths there are compared to combat deaths, right? Yeah. It's, it's even outside of combat. It's very dangerous to be flying planes in, 19, in the 1940s, right? Yeah. A lot of this technology is fairly new. With the Wright brothers was at 1906, I believe, yeah, right? Yeah. Our first. So this is only only 40 years later, less than 40 years later, and we're we're flying these massive bombers, and we're we're you know we have these big crews, and you're putting high incendiary bombs and everything like them. So just the with, nature with, of the beast with a year training, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's the he crazy joined, part. <laughs> well. Let's see, he, he uh, made, joined in 41, December. He, and then in July of 42, he's, he's made pilot. Right? Oh, my God, not <laughs> right. even a year. He's got his wings, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're rushing these guys to the battlefield. Can you imagine field. you get on a plane and you're like, hey, bro, how long have <laughs> you been flying? Exactly. Four months, yeah, yeah, five yeah, months. Just a, a commercial airline. If, <laughs> if you knew your pilots were all, you were all 18 or 21 to 25-year-olds, yeah. yeah, I don't think I would be getting on that plane and then yeah. flying it into combat. But again... He's going to be sent to Florida, and while there, he's going to be marry his wife, who was Elizabeth Jane Young, and she was also from Chicago. So I'm, I'm assuming he met her in the yeah. club days, but I can't uh, find a whole lot of information on that. And then six months after that, his unit's going to be sent over to Europe to fight in the war, right? Damn. So a year. Right. One a year. A year from, from, Sign up. from being he's in the fighting. club in Chicago, right, to you're in training. The, the world changes fast. Pearl Harbor is going to change things fast. So it doesn't take long. And... and it's across the board. Some of these guys, they went from high school to infantry combat in less than a year, you know, so, so he's going to be one of those. So Lou's going to deploy to Europe with the 450 Bombardment Squadron Medium, 322nd Bombardment Group based out of RAF Bury Street, Edmonds. So they're going to be stationed in England, and they're going to be flying back and forth over to the continent, which is terrifying. And we've talked about the, the casualty rates of the Air Corps. Yeah. And in the 8th Air Force, at certain times, it was 50% of these planes were not making it back. So either 
getting shot out of the sky with, with you oh, know, crash. killed in action, crashed, POW, what have you. The odds were horrific at this time. And in the early, early war, we're still figuring things out. And the Germans have massive defenses. And, you know, there's things with the fighter planes and the fuel. And it's, it's just, just a massive risk. And it's, Oof. yeah. 50%. It's a coin flip. Right. Ugh. Right. At certain times in the war, I should, should yeah. clarify. That wasn't throughout the duration. But certain types of bombing missions. And, and that's what he's going to be experienced with. That's what they're going up against. So he's a little older at 26. But these guys are basically accepting their fate and accepting that we very, may will, we very, way, may, we very well may die, yeah. right? But we're going to do it anyways. Every time that plane takes off, you're, you're flying hours into the inevitable, right? You, you're not going to get a free ride. They're, they don't want you coming. So yeah. you're going to be facing flak. You're going to be facing German and it's fighters. Early. You're gonna, it's early in the war. So the Luftwaffe is still very powerful yeah. at this point. At this point... He ends up making first lieutenant in uh, January of 1943. And then his first mission is on May 14th, 1943. Okay. So May, May 14th, 1940, I'm sorry, May 14th, 1943 is his first mission. And the group is going to fly their B-26 bombers from England, and they're going to make a low-level attack against a power station in Holland. So wait, he's in the, sh- he's in the clubs in Chicago. Right. Before 19, December 1941. With no knowledge of flying, right. no knowledge of being a pilot, no knowledge of combat, <laughs> exactly. and a year and a half later, he's flying a mission. Correct. Over, wow. uh, over Nazi-occupied Holland. That is crazy. Right? Where they're waiting you think for of a you. worse condition? Where they're waiting for you. Yeah. Exactly. So, and this was actually the first ever low-level attack ever attempted by B-26s on enemy-held territory. So this is... This they is don't a, even know if it'll work. This is a crapshoot. Yeah, let's, let's see if, we, if these, these planes are capable of carrying out this mission, and if, they're, if they surpass the, the um, acceptable casualties or if it's below. So on that mission, their commanding officer, the whole 322nd, was killed when his plane was shot down and 10 other planes were hit. So this first lever, low-level mission, yeah. right? It's successful, but it's their commander is killed, right? This isn't just some fluke thing. 10 other planes are hit. So it's like, okay, that was a little bit hairy, but he's going to survive that. So if, if there's no going back now, right? Yeah. You, you put yourself in this position. You wanted to be a flyboy, and now here you are. So it's, it's That's crazy. You, you have to accept that courage. And then on May 17th, 1943, he wasn't on this mission, but 11 B-26 bombers from his unit, the 322nd, flew over another low-level mission over Holland. One airplane had to divert for mechanical problems right away, but the rest of the aircraft, all other 10 aircraft, flew over, flew over Highland to try to drop their payload, and all 10 were shot down by anti-aircraft artillery. 60 Jeez. airmen were lost. Is that the flak and stuff? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So this is his unit. So on their, their one Everybody, of their early missions, nobody every came single back. plane, the only plane that survived is because they turned around. Every other plane was shot out of the Those sky. Those are his buddies. Those are his buddies. And think about what that means for you, right? Because again, you don't get to go home. But thankfully, the brass realized this isn't, this isn't going to work. So after that, they, they decided they were going to focus on medium altitude attacks instead of the low altitude. Yeah. Because what low altitude... We're more accurate. We can hit our targets, but, but the Germans are, are going to nail you, yeah. right? And you, you, ten out of ten planes getting lost is a disaster. Damn. Every single every single airman that went on that pl- on that that mission did not come back. How many? Sixty men died. Ten planes. So it's six man crews. You can figure. Wow. Think, think about the effects of that. Yeah. Think about the effects of that on your mind when you're back in England and, yeah. and you have to suit up for the next mission and the next mission and the next These mission. These are guys you've done homework exactly. with, training with, bumped with. A handful with, of them, with. you might have been with them your whole military career at yeah. that point. But he's going to keep flying those missions because that's what, that's Damn, what you dude. have to do. This is war. We have to defeat this enemy, and we're the only that way. That bravery in itself right there just exactly. to keep going forward. It's, it's a sustained courage, yeah. right? And it's, it's a very, like you said, it's very different than being on the ground as an infantryman and pushing forward and, and seeing the enemy and reacting to it. It's a, okay, I'm putting myself in this position, and now I have to deal with it. It's that, those nerves of steel, because a lot of guys on the plane, the, the pilot's not shooting his gun, you know, he's yeah. not doing anything. The, the, There's no ejection or anything. Right, you're just, you have to, to keep your nerves, and you have to keep your calm, and you have to keep your There's still. no, like, parachuting out of those things? You can. It oh, depends. Yeah, yeah they, they have chutes, but, I mean, depending on how the planes hit, if, it's, if the, the wings hit and you're in a spin, you're not getting out. Yeah. If, you know, if, if you're hit immediately... The enemy fighters are shooting 50 cal rounds at you. Oh the flag, you know, God. the guys are getting shot up in the air, you know, bleeding out. Oh. And there. It's, it's, it's a disaster, man. But like I said, this, the only way to go home is through the enemy. So he's going to keep flying, and he's going to be promoted to captain in 1943, and a year later he's going to make major. He's going to continue in combat until March of 1945. Okay, which is right before the end of the war in Europe, which yeah. is May 8th of 1945. So he fought through the whole thing. Fought through the, essentially the whole war because... The early parts of the war were in North Africa, yeah. in Europe. So, yeah, most of the whole European war, his, he's going to be part of that, and he's going to be experiencing that combat. 
His superiors noted his tactical skill, courage, and inspirational, um, inspirational leader, leadership. By the end of the war, he had flown 68 missions and earned two distinguished flying crosses. Damn. So 68 combat missions, 68 of these missions where you don't know if you're coming back, 68 of these missions where you're flying for hours with fatigue and fear and, uh. and you know, aches and pains and everything, and then you're flying, and then you, as you get there, you start seeing the flak come up, and then you start seeing the German fighters, and then you drop your payload, and then you move back. But it's for that cause, right? If you don't do it, if you don't drop your payload and you don't hit your target, someone else is going to have to do it on the next wow, one. Man. 68 missions he's Imagine just that. the death that he encountered exactly with, within his crews. Right. You know what well, I mean? Well, 10, 10 out of 60. 10 planes on the one. 60 guys well, you out start, of his unit. That's just one, though. Right. Imagine 68 missions, how many he lost. You know what I mean? Exactly. Imagine that preying on your nerves, Ugh. right? Because you, you'll see a and lot of guys. the survivor's guilt mm-hmm. and all the other shit that comes with it. You'll see a lot of guys in combat that are, that are badass soldiers. They're the biggest, they're toughest, and then they'll get wounded, and then they, they lose their nerve. They're yeah. shaky, and they're scared after that. I've yeah. seen it countless times. Imagine that with the airmen. You can, you can be courageous for so long, but you, start, you have to start to realize, okay, after 25 Eventually. missions, I, everybody else is getting hurt. I'm not. Yeah. The next I'm one's going to be big, right? And then you might see a plane to your left or your right go down, and you're thinking, okay, you just have to accept, accept it. it. So the war ends, and he ended up being released from active duty on August 5th of 1945, which is right at the end of the uh, So August. he comes home exactly how he wanted to. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. He made it through. He's, he's that fly boy, you know, yeah. he's those, those fancy guys. And he's going to briefly leave active duty, and he's going to pursue a career as a commercial pilot, which a lot of pilots yeah. still oh, do. Yeah. You know, that's the those, are your, those are the pilots that you want. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, a lot of, uh, lot, of, lot of commercial pilots are military anyways, but like when we were younger and stuff, most of those were Vietnam vets. We'd exactly. Go and be those I remember those flying when I was a kid, and you had the gray gray mustache guy who's a <laughs> yeah. Vietnam you're like I'm good yeah I'm good yeah <laughs> he can handle no worries he can handle uh, anything that this, the civilian skies are going to yeah. throw at us because yeah. he's flown through all that so he's going to try that briefly but he just, he's actually going to return to active duty I don't know if it was because he missed it or if there was good opportunities Dude, for him you're never going to get that kind of juice Think about what kind of guy he is. Again, yeah. a fraternity guy. The master said he wants action. Yeah. You know, he probably likes the excitement. And by this point, he's got all these guys looking up to him. He's led all these young men through this war. Yeah. All, think about it from that perspective. He, you know, he's a major at this point. All these guys were under him, and he brought a lot How of these high guys is major? home safely. Uh, it's first lieutenant, second, or second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain, um, and then major. So, it's, oh, so it's, it's, it's different in the infantry than... But he's, in, in high high but he's pretty high up. Yeah, he's, he's several promotions. So he up. also has probably like a a real confidence in his ability that he that exactly. he's better than who's up there. Well, he is because he's yeah. flown sixty eight missions. So right? when you have that kind of skill, you're exactly. thinking, "Man, I got to be there. Mm-hmm. I can do it better." You know, right? And the kind of guy that joined that soon after Pearl Harbor, there's going to be some patriotism and there's going to be some pride there. And yeah. There's going to be, you know, he's a fraternity guy, so my unit's the best. I'm going to yeah. make him the best. So he, he, there's probably some of that. And after World War II, the, the post-war Air Force, or the Army Air Corps until 1947, was in a complete state of disorganization. The size went from 2.4 million men and women to less than 400,000, and no combat yeah. no combat capability whatsoever, right? We, after World War II, we drew down our forces to skeleton size. The Marine Corps, they, almost, they talked about getting rid of the Marine Corps. Really? Uh, yeah, the, the Army shrunk to insignificance. You know, all the branches went back down small, and a lot of our military guys were fighting and saying, there's going to be another war, and, yeah. but a lot of the politicians are saying, we just won the big one, so they're scrapping these planes, and they're turning them into homes, and they're doing all this yeah. stuff. So... He's going back into this, and you can imagine a guy that's seen war thinking like, okay, I have to do, I have to do the right thing for the guys that are here because yeah. another war is going to come, and when it does, we need to be combat ready, and we need to have that capability. Lou's going to have several positions. He's going to work as a, a Mustang and shooting star instructor pilot, and the, the Mustangs went from a P-51 to an F-51, the designation, so I might transpose back in there, but a Mustang test pilot and a shooting star instructor pilot, and then he's going to ed- attend air tactical school in Florida. Two years later, the Air Force is officially established. So in 1947, I believe, is when the Air Force actually okay. separates from the Army. A lot of these pilots at the time, too, it's, it's, it's crazy that we don't... Like, you look at pilots and you almost take it for granted. A lot of these dudes were flying test planes. They were flying experiment. Like, think of the, the, the courage of yeah. that and the, and the brave, you know, like a lot of the, the astronauts, John Glenn and those, those guys were test pilots. That's, yeah. that's insanity. Not only facing the enemy, it's literally, here's an untested plane. Let's see how fast you can get it. Or, or you know, let's, let's test out these new shoots and stuff. That's the kind of guy that we're dealing with here. That's crazy. So in 1948, Lou's going to take command of the 67th Fighter Bomber Squadron of the 18th Fighter Bomber Group, 5th Air Force. And they're going to be stationed in Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. So 
back overseas, but we're not in a combat setting, right? All the guys in the unit are going to look up to him because it's 1948. A lot of those World War II vets have got out, so it's going to be a lot of new guys. And a lot of these guys haven't seen combat. So now your, your commander has flown 68 combat missions in Europe. So he's, he's the guy, right? Yeah. So they're all going to be you know, in awe of him, essentially. And he's probably loving it just because yeah. of the kind of guy he is. So he's training them, too, because he's an instructor pilot. So he's trying to make his unit the best, and he's trying to make these guys understand yeah, we're test pilots, or yeah, we're pilots, yeah, we're, you know, we're air jockeys, there's, there's, there's a glamour, but there's a reason for this. There's combat will be on the horizon again, it is coming, the world's changing, and you need to be ready when it comes, right? In the Philippines, there's not a lot to do necessarily, not a lot of good things to do, so they're going to be spending a lot of times getting to know each other and, and in these huts, these kinset huts, or however you pronounce that, and they're going to be discussing, you know, talking about combat and talking about what would you do and the thing that soldiers have been doing since the first you know soldier picked up a spear talking about death and and yeah. dying essentially and, and what would you do right so lou was was um noted for con common regularly talking about his sen sentiment supporting suicide attacks and using your plane to crash into the enemy if you know if you're, you're gonna die. if you know you're gonna die and at one point he said if you have to die then take some of the enemy with you so <laughs> think about your commander like that yeah. too this isn't your commander that's like hey guys let's back off and the, this is a guy that's that's flown 68 combat missions he's lived a lot of life and he's saying fight. not only am i going to kill the enemy but i'll take myself out if i have to do it so yeah. these guys are going to be looking up to him in 1950 his son was born Louis Joseph Flip Seville the third. So he's he's a junior. So life changes when you have a kid, right? Yeah. He's he's in charge of all these guys already that are not his children at all, but but he has he owes something to them, but now he's gonna have a son. So that's gonna change you a little bit. But in June twenty fifth, nineteen fifty, the Korean War is gonna begin. And we've talked about this quite a bit on the show. To a lot of people it was a shock, right? North Korea is gonna invade South Korea. North Korea is gonna overrun South Korea. We the the thirty eighth parallel is gonna divide Communist North Korea from, from U.S.-supported and the Western-supported South Korea. We were not ready, and they were not ready. So the North steamrolled. They came across with armored vehicles. They came across with, with tanks and, and artillery. The U.S. joined the war on June 27, 1950. This is going to be the U.N.'s first action. We formed the U.N. after World War II, right, hoping that we could negotiate peace and not have these wars. Yeah. This is going to be the first test, and right. it was not going well. So when the Korean War begins, Lou's going to lead his squadron, and they're going to go to Japan to try to, def to stop this invasion, to try to help these troops on the ground. We've talked about it quite a bit on this show. Our troops that were over there, a lot of them, I think it was the 24th Infantry Division and the 1st Cavalry Division, they were occupation troops in Japan, right? Living a fairly decent life, having, paying Japanese women to do their laundry yeah. and shine their boots. You know, they're kind of living that occupation lifestyle. And now they're thrust into combat, and they were not ready. We did not have the, the weapons. We did not have the equipment. So we were basically trying to prevent ourselves from getting overrun. And the North Koreans pushed our troops back all the way to the Pusan perimeter. We were just essentially clinging for life. But our troops were on the run, right? Yeah. They were fighting, but... They were trying to fight tanks with rifles, with yeah. M1 Garands, with Thompson submachine guns, with some mortars and artillery, but we didn't have the capability to defend ourselves. So it was a, a, a fight for our life. So Lou and these other guys are their lifeline. These guys have to get over there. So as soon as they get to Japan, they immediately start flying sorties in defense of South Korea from an airfield in Japan, Japan and then later in Taegu and Pusan, which is, which is uh, South Korea. So their aircraft, which normally would be you know, flying high level and dropping bombs, they were repurposed for close air support strikes against the North Korean ground troops and the front lines. So now they're going to be trying to fly down and actually attack these infantry troops and attack these small level units yeah. that are chasing our guys, right? As opposed to flying over targets like he did in Europe yeah. and dropping bombs on factories. Totally different. Totally different. Now they're going to be going down and trying to strafe these enemy and take as many of them out as we can to prevent them going. This isn't flying over occupied territory to stop their capabilities to make war. This is literally stopping these troops from killing our troops that right. you can probably see as you're flying over them, right? So it's going to be a crazy change, and it's going to be chaos to a degree, right? It's, 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 it literally, they steamrolled our troops, and we have to get into action now. Whatever we have, let's go. So as a World War II vet, and again, as this, this brazen commander, all these guys are going to be looking up to him. So he knows yeah. he has to be courageous, and he knows he has to set this, this proper example. Because these new guys, some of them might not have expected to be in combat, and now here they are in this, this crazy war that we never thought would come, right? And the war's going poorly as our troops are pushed south to the Pusan perimeter. Our troops are desperately fighting as they retreat, and they're relying on this air support. Just 
just to stay alive. You remember when we've talked about this on some of yeah. the, this, this seesaw of the Korean War. And in the early war, there was a drought. We often think of Korea when we think of the freezing cold. In the early war, it was a drought. The country hadn't been that dry in a long time. The troops were, had no water as they're retreating. They're trying to drink out of rice paddies, which are fertilized with human feces. So they're yeah. getting sick. So they're walking and they're you know, having diarrhea and they're emptying their bowels. And you can hear the artillery from the enemy and you're just trying to get to safety. And you don't know what safety looks like as a ground troop because how far are we going to fall back? Yeah. We're trying to get to Pusan perimeter. What if they breach the perimeter? Then what do we have, right? We're desperately trying to get our troops from the mainland to get over there. But what if we get steamrolled before then? How many bodies are, is it going to cost to hold off these troops? And am I going to be one of them. Yeah. So think about that as an infantryman, yeah, man, right? Insane. So these these airmen's job is extremely important, and they have to be on top of, it and they have to they have to be sharp, and they have to fight with skill and courage. On August 5th, 1950, Lou is going to lead his formation of Mustangs, and they're going to be armed with guns, rockets, and 500 pounds in the enemy territory. Oh. Korean troops are closing in on our enemy, our, our, on our retreating troops. They're getting closer and closer. And Lou and his men are to ordered to a cat attack a camouflaged area that's filled with enemy troops, artillery, and armored vehicles that are threatening the security of the ground troops. Okay? So they know this camouflaged area has armored vehicles. Our guys don't have armor. You can't fight tanks with rifles. Yeah. You, I don't care how many movies you watch. It's not happening. You're going to get steamrolled. You can't, as you're retreating, if that artillery is pounding you, it's going to be cutting you to bits, right? And you're going to be carrying your friends and trying to get out. This is a literal retreat. They we're literally trying to escape. Yeah. You know, terrifying. So Lou, is, his plane is, and all these other Mustangs, they're going to be loaded with two 500-pound bombs, one on each wing, six rockets, and six M2 Browning 50 cal machine guns that... You're a big fan of the 50 cal. Yeah. We also talk about that. It's the same as the ones they're rocking on the ground. So they're going to be out of the wing shooting 50 caliber rounds. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a heavy round. And his uh, Captain Martin Johnson later wrote, it was a close air support strike against enemy targets in southern Korea. It was a grand day for flying when our four F-51 Mustangs took off at about two in the afternoon. So skies are clear. You know, these pilots are looking at it as a grand day for flying because there's a little bit of that, that bravado to it still. But... These guys are going to be taking off, and they're going to be going to face the enemy. And we talked about it on, on the episode with Thomas Hudner. The enemy has figured out how to knock our planes out of the sky with rifle fire, too, right? Really? So they, they mask, they'll, they'll hide, and they'll wait for our planes to fly over, and then they'll all fire one volley together to try to get as many rounds as they can to get a fuel tank or to get what have you, right? Yeah. So it's not just flak, it's not just artillery, it's not just the big guns. These small rifles can take out our planes that are flying that low. And yeah. if you've ever seen the, the P-51 or the F-51 Mustangs, what they look like flying through the sky, it, it's, they're not super armored, they're yeah. not super heavy, so it's very reasonable for them to be able to take these out. Right. But our guys are, are brave, they're courageous, and they know what they have to do. So no one's hesitating. So as soon as they take off, Lou's wingman has to go back because of a mechanical problem. So there's three remaining F-51s. Him and two other guys are going to keep going. So three guys, it was supposed to be four, are flying up against this armored column. And you think, okay, they're up in the sky, you know, these, these fancy floppies. Imagine the courage it takes for you and three guys in a... In, a Mustang would be like flying, I mean, it's, it's like a Porsche. It's an awesome, awesome uh, vehicle, or I shouldn't say, it's an awesome plane, but it's a, an awesome aircraft, but it's, it's very lightly armored, right? Yeah. You're flying into the mouth of the enemy to protect these guys on the ground, these guys that you've never met, but you wear the same uniform, you wear the same flag, yeah. and you respect and you understand that you have to save these guys so they can fight another day. So you and three guys are going to be flying with your rockets and your bombs and your audacity and your courage, and you're going to try to do as much as you can to stop these guys from killing our young men. So Lou and his wingmen are going to approach their target at an altitude of 5,000 feet. They're going for, towards this camouflaged area, right? But as they're doing so, they see a North Korean armored column of trucks, artillery, guns, and armored cars led by North Korean armored personnel, car armored personnel carriers crossing a river in a shallow area. So they're going for their target, and they see the river. Our troops are on one side, the enemy's on the other, and the enemy's just coming across this river. They found a shallow area. An armored personnel carrier means, like, it's an armored vehicle with troops in the back. So yeah. everything is coming after our guys, and they're going to be getting there quicker. So they know that the American ground troops don't have a chance. They can't stop this advance, and they're going to be in bad shape if it reaches them. If these guys are able to cross the river and catch up to our troops, all we can do is die or surrender, right? Yep. They can fight valiantly, but you can't beat them. You can't. We are on foot and in trucks, and we're trying to get the hell out of there, and these guys are coming with big guns and armor. You can't stop that armor. So it's a life-or-death situation for these guys on the ground. These 18-, 19-year-old draftees, these, these occupation troops that were thrust into this, you know, these guys that a few months before might have been yeah. at home in high school and now they're desperately fighting for their lives they're trying to get to Pusan and they're going to be facing this so Lou and, and his men see this and they know that they have to stop them right 
There's only three of them, but they have to stop them. So Lou, being the leader that he is, he's going to take command, and he dives immediately at the column. So you can imagine the North Koreans, you know, you're crossing the river, and all of a sudden these three Mustangs come. Aww. So Lee, exactly. He's going to dive down, and he wants to drop both of his 500-pound bombs. He's, you know, I got something for you guys, yeah. right? So he's going to fly down. But as he flies down, he's going to hit that bomb release button on his control stick, and then he's going to make a sharp turn up to try to get out of his own blast and also out of, you know, any enemy, enemy attack. However, there was a mechanical problem, so only one of his bombs dropped off of the plane. And that kind of shows you the state of the Air Force at the time, yeah. right? We had one out of four planes fly back because of mechanical problems, and now only one of his bombs is dropping. So Damn. think about that. So because of that, he loses one, one bomb, but now he's unbalanced. So he actually misses the column, and he has to steer up in, in a wobble, right, essentially, because he has that unbalanced weight. He's trying to hit the, the bomb release, but that bomb won't budge. Something's wrong. Okay? Oh, he can't get rid of that bomb, and he missed that, that armored column, right? So now his bomb is gone. He only has one bomb. He still has his rockets, and he still has his machine guns. But now it's a problem. If he can't get rid of that bomb, he's going to be unbalanced, but also that, co that column's not stopping, okay? So when he regains his altitude, he sees that his attack wasn't successful, and his second bomb's still attached. So with his malfunctioning plane, right, despite mechanical problems, instead of saying, I need to fly back and get this fixed, this could be risking my life, but he knows that he has an obligation to his men, and he has an obligation more so to those troops on the ground. So he decides, I'm going to go down and I'm going to strafe the enemy, okay? My bombs may not work, but I have rockets and I have machine guns. So I'm going to yeah. fly into these guys, and I'm going to cause as much damage as destruction as I can. He's going to just fly directly into the face of this enemy that knows he's there now because he just did one unsuccessful bombing run. So... Now, the Americans are taking heavy return fire from the ground. The North Koreans see what's their threat. It's these three guns, or these three planes up in the air, one yeah. of which is somewhat disabled, right? Yeah. So they're going to start shifting everything they have. They're going to be firing machine guns. They're going to be firing, presumably, the artillery. They're going to be firing everything they can at Lou and his men. So Lou's going to take his other dive, and he's going to be firing those rockets, and he's going to be firing those machine guns. He's going to be trying to kill as many of these guys as he can, right? North Korean anti-aircraft fire is ready for him, though. So as he's diving, his plane is going to get struck, and he's going to, when he's making, attempting to make that seven, second run, and it's going to heavily damage his aircraft, and he's going to start trailing smoke and coolant. So his other wingmen are going to see, you're, 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 you're hurt. Your plane is crippled. You need to get out of here, right? You're deep into enemy territory. You're leaking coolant. You already have one bomb on one wing and one on the yeah. other, so you're already wobbling. So his wingman, or one of his wingmen, Johnson, sees that he's badly injured, and he tells him, I don't think your plane's going to be able to fly much longer. Lou, right? You need to get out of here. So Johnson warned Lou, and he said, you need to get out of here and make a run to friendly territory. You're, you're leaking coolant, but you're still flying. You can get out of here. He could try to make an emergency landing at a U.S.-held area, which is Tegu, which is a short area away. He can presumably fly there, yeah. and he can land. Or he can bail out and take his chances, right? You can bail out. You're in enemy territory, but you can escape and evade, and you can get back. But you need to get out of here. Otherwise, you're going to crash, and you're going to go up in a ball of flame. Yeah. Remember our other episode with Hunter yeah. and Brown, right? Yeah. Those kinds of things. You're watching your, your buddy, your wingman. You're seeing him link that coolant, and you're thinking, you got to get out of here, yeah. right? You're probably you, with that bomb on because he can't drop his bomb. Yeah. Remember, Hudner talked Brown through dropping your bombs and everything. He can't drop his bomb. If he crashes, he's going up in a ball of flame. Yeah. So you either need to bail the hell out, or you need to try to fly to safe territory, right? But Sibyl refuses. Lou refuses. He adamantly says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not out of this fight. I'm going to stay here. Because he knows if he doesn't complete this mission, yeah. another crew is going to have to come back. More airmen are going to have to come back and risk their lives, right? Yep. But more importantly, if he doesn't destroy that armored column, by the time it makes for them to get back and make a report and another passed. crew to get up, they're going to get past, and they're going to kill these soldiers on the ground. Yeah. They're going to kill these infantrymen who have no other protection other than these guns. So... Lou still has his guns, and he wants a second chance to try to drop that remaining bomb. He wants to use that bomb, he says, yeah. because he has the means to cause destruction to the enemy, so he's not going to stop. But he knows that bomb won't drop, so rather than retreating or rather than falling back, he decides he's going to die a warrior's death, right? He's been talking oh, this his whole life, so into the radio, and this is his last recorded words. They said, Lou, you need to get out of here. You're trailing coolant. And he replied, I'll never make it back. I'm going to get that bastard. So then they watched as he turned off his, his mic. <laughs> he could have bailed out or tried to escape, like we said, but instead of saving himself, he decided he was going to inflict the maximum effect, the maximum damage that he could on the enemy, and that's exactly what he did. So at his two partners watched, his, jets, or his Mustang still armed with that 500-pound bomb. He takes another turn, and he's going to line directly up at that column, right? 
And then as he's going to start to descend into his 30 degree angle, he's going to start firing his 50 cal guns. So he's by himself. But like I said, instead of diverting off or trying to get to safety, he just dives. comes around and he dives directly into the enemy. And he starts firing those 50 cal machine guns to get those guys on the ground. And as he gets closer, he's firing those rockets with his gun blazing. And he's going at that 30 degree angle just like he should. And he's going to drive, dive straight towards that armored column. But instead of pulling up at 2,000 feet and trying to drop his bomb, he's going to deliberately dive his airplane, and he crashes directly into the target while firing his machine guns until he dies. <laughs> so he's, he holds down the trigger on, a, on, his, on his 50 cal machine guns, and he f- turns himself into a human bomb, essentially. So as Johnson watched, Lou crashed into the North Korean convoy, and his plane and the targets erupted into a huge ball of fire. And his final act destroyed a large contingent of the North North Korean ground troops and the vehicles at the cost of his own. So essentially, he turned himself into a kamikaze. Damn. And Jonathan later said, we lost a remarkable friend, a fine commander, and a very brave man. He could have done anything he could, but like I said, just... It's this one. You can almost picture him getting excited. Exactly. Like, oh, Here we go. <laughs> yes. He's talked himself into it his yeah, whole life, yeah. right? But he was able to, with that 500 pound bomb, with his rockets, he was able to stop that armored column because you figure the other vehicles can't move around the destruction yeah. he caused, whatever was left there. So how? Who knows how many lives he saved? Yeah. Who knows how many infantrymen that never knew he existed, yeah. that never knew he was behind them fighting for their lives, right? But by his audacity, his courage, and his selflessness, yeah, he was able to stop that armored column. So. That's pretty this badass. is the story of an American kamikaze, essentially, right? Man. And for his actions, he earned the Medal of Honor, which was later presented. In late August of 1951, his widow and his 19-month-old son were presented with the Medal of Honor at March Air Force Base, which no is way. right here in uh, yeah. San Bernardino, which is, I'm sorry, in uh, Riverside, yeah. uh, not too far from us, so it's kind of a local thing. And they actually, even though he was in the Air Force, they gave his, his wife the Army version because there wasn't an Air Force version yet. The, which I, they actually didn't make till, till 1965. And he was the Air Force's first Medal of Honor recipient because the, the branch was a new branch. Yeah. So he's one of only four Air Force members to have earned the Medal of Honor during the Korean War. And this was the, the final cap in his feather, essentially, to a decorated airman who had earned two distinguished flying cross, crosses, 12 air medals during World War II. And he was buried in Illinois, which is uh, near Chicago, where, yeah. he, where he had spent so much time. That's amazing. So, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's interesting because there was actually controversy of awarding him the medal because of his suicide action. They don't necessarily want to encourage that type yeah. of behavior, right? But the difference between him and perhaps a Japanese kamikaze is he wasn't trained to go into combat and die. He wasn't yeah. trained to, you know, ex- expect death and there's nothing left and you're going to dishonor your family. Americans are, are encouraged to survive, right? It's not yeah. our job to die for your country. It's to make the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. That's yeah. how you win wars, essentially, right? But he had been talking to his man and he, he had established this prior to, I'm not going to go out and, and try to run away. If it comes my time to die, I'm going to die like a man, like Tecumseh, right? Sing, yeah. sing your death song and die like a warrior going home. I'm going to have control of the situation. So he was determined to stop that column. Well, as soon as he saw that column, he knew that it meant death for the Americans on the ground. And he no knew hesitation. that he was going to stop it, right? <laughs> and, and his final recorded words, I'm going to get those bastards, or I'm going to get that bastard. Like, <laughs> you can imagine, like, like you, you sons of bitches, you shot my plane up. Like, all right, yeah. again, I got something for you, right? Yeah. You can Im- Think of that kind of guy, and, and these these pilots. I can't say it enough. They're 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 the race car drivers. They're the sports. Yes. You know, they're those guys. The guys that that are willing to risk their life just to fly. Yeah. Now you put them in a situation, right? Now you put them in a situation where where other people's lives are on the line, and that's you know kind of what ended up happening here. Yeah, and people that might have thought, oh, he's an attention guy. He's on the <laughs> right. No, he yeah. was really about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was about it. And I I, I thought it was funny though when they mentioned that in the Philippines he would often bring his guys in and talk because like I said when I was in Iraq we'd always talk about oh what do you want to do like if you're going to die how do you want to get the people talk about that you have yeah. to you're living a strange life it's not normal for human beings to face death every day to face death every day and it's not normal for human beings to make these extreme weapons of war and use yeah. them against each other right killing is part of the human condition unfortunately you know conflict is part of the human conditioning but making making armies and slamming into each other yeah. whether it's you know the the Spartans and the Persians that's not natural yeah. like it sure it's happened a lot but that is an odd place to find yourself that's not what we're how we've evolved yeah. or, what, or how we were designed or however you want to want, want to look at that so we come to terms with that and we come to terms with that by by talking you know if you die, do you want to know it? You know, it, what, what would you do if one of your grenade pins got pulled? You run through scenarios. You know, yeah. what would you do if you found yourself surrounded? What, you know, so to an airman, 
they're talking, you know, would you try to bail out? Would you try to get to safety? And he says, no, you know, I, I would slam right into it. I'm going to take as many of them out as I can. And these young guys are probably in awe because a guy that's flown 60 plus missions, they're like, yeah. hey, maybe he really would. But somebody's probably thinking, nah, he, I don't think he'd do it. But balls to the walls like that, 68 missions, he had to have moments that were close. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, I guess that would be the... His very first mission as a young aviator, his, his commander was killed. Yeah. You know, that's a big deal. Yeah. So you can imagine what he's gone through. That's pretty badass. Yeah, it's, it's a very different... I, I just think it's funny because I mentioned I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I'm going with Sibyl, but he's the Air Force's first Medal of Honor recipient. And he can't... And uh, but not, when I no, go on YouTube, there's, there's no, no videos. No, no movie? All I wanted was somebody to say his name so I could be like, okay, that's how you say it. But there's not. I can find text, but it's, it's, it's crazy to me. Like, and there's no movie? No, there's no movies on most of these guys. This one would be, a t- you could totally see that final scene. Being Can't you, <laughs> right? Yes. Him, him wheeling around, lining yes. straight up, and then coming in with the guns chattering while the rockets are going off, yeah. you know, and then slamming in. You can imagine the North Koreans, if they could see anything, if they, if they weren't just getting killed, you know, waiting for him to pull up, and then him not pulling up, and yeah. just slamming into him, Dang. using that. Imagine his buddies that watched Oh, it. I know. Yeah, that's what Johnson said. We lost a fine man and a, and a brave man, a fine wow. leader and a brave man, right? That's, that's an understatement, if there ever was one. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow, that's a good one. Yeah, so been a while, but yeah. uh, that's that's the story of uh, Lou Sibyl, which is our Air Force Medal of Honor. Cool uniform too. We've actually done it. Yeah, th- I had to piece it together a little bit. This is the the crisp, nice, nice Air Force blues. Because, yeah. like I said, prior to the Air Force, they were the Army Air Corps, so yeah. they had the brown uh, or the pinks and greens and and all that. But it's a little bit different. Pretty sweet. Yeah. So once again, thanks for watching. Uh, if you guys caught, I did the little clip in my collection room. Going to try to do some more of those, try to do some filler. Like I said, unfortunately, it's hard for Donnie and I to get together sometimes because uh, Donnie works 800 hours a week <laughs> and I work about, you know, 50, 60 or so. <laughs> so uh, um, but we're going to try to try to keep getting you guys that content. So let us know. Leave the comments if you guys Check want. out this hoarder's hoard. Yeah. Check it's out my, cool. my hoarding uh, so I can get on TLC or And the, or and the videos that, that you're is. seeing... Or it's like a, a small fraction of what he really has. Yeah. Don't let the two rows fool you. <laughs> yeah, I have quite a bit more, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. or fortunately, depending on how like, you look. Like, comment, subscribe, please. Cool. Thanks for watching. Later.